And we're live. Hey, everybody. This is Mike from the Real Black Podcast. Uh, joining us tonight on, uh, thank you for joining us tonight, August 8th, 2021. Uh, we have a very special guest uh, about to appear. And we're going to just wait for the room to fill up. How's everybody doing? Can you hear me okay? Can you see me okay? Can I get a thumbs up? Can I get a woot woot? Can I get a woot woot? Can I get a what what? Just uh, a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Uh, but uh, tonight we've got a great guest uh, with us, uh, Miss Tanya Pinkins. I'll read from her Wikipedia. Uh, Tanya Pinkins, I'm not going to give the, the date of her birth. Born May 30th, is an American filmmaker, writer, producer, and director. Her award-winning debut feature, Red Pill, was an official selection at the 2021 Pan-African Film Festival, and it won the Best Black Lives Matter feature and the Best First feature at the Mykonos International Film Festival. That's Greece, I would imagine. Uh, the Best First feature at the Lulea Film Festival and is nominated for awards in numerous festivals around the globe. Her web series, The Red Pilling of America, can be heard on her podcast. You can't say that at the, the uh, Broadway Producers Network, the Broadway Podcast Network. As a television, film, and theater actress and author, she's best known for her portrayal of Livia Fire Fry on the soap opera All My Children and for her roles on Broadway. She's been nominated for three Tony Awards. That's three more than me. <laughs> And well-deserved, of course. I kid. I see her laughing. Uh, and, and she won one Tony Award. And she's won an Obie Lortel Drama Desk, Outer Critics Circle, Adelco Garland, LA Drama Critics Circle, Clarence Derwent, NAACP Theater Award. She's been nominated for the Olivier, the Helen Hayes, the Noel, the Joseph Jefferson, the NAACP. Oh my God! How did we get Tanya Pinkins on the show? Let's uh, let's jump into the trailer before we bring her on. Here is the trailer, folks, for Red Pill. We are a majority in this country, and we're gonna win the election. Do you know what the red pill is? A red pill is someone who infiltrates a group and then destroys them from the inside. This place is spooky. Some people like to live dangerously. Gas, why are you so jumpy tonight? You know what, guys? I'm gonna go back tomorrow. Did you hear about the creature woman that attacked a father and son hunting down here? I don't see the case. This place creeps me out. I think we should call the sheriff's office. The only people missing or dead are brown people. They're after all of us. What do we do, Amelia? We die. But we take some of them with us. Wow. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> I'm, I'm scared. And I'm concerned. <laughs> I think this might be the first election day horror film. There, there's been Friday the 13th. Horror, and you're going to screen, by the way, Friday the 13th in New York City, free screening at St. Uh, St. Nicholas Park, uh, yeah. 35th Street in St. Nicholas. Um, but congratulations. I think this is, might be the first election day horror film. <laughs> Let me think. The Purge hasn't done an election day. Oh, horror. there was. You're right. There is a Purge yeah, election day. Definitely but the they purge. made up their own elections. Well, this yeah, this is centered know. around some real stuff. Yeah. Totally. So welcome to welcome to the Real Black Podcast. I'm excited. Thank you. Yeah, we got we we're filling the room is filling up. We've got about 57 people with us from all over the planet, and you're certainly and we're going to take your uh, questions the second half of the chat. So uh, I'll I'll be adding a link to uh, so you can join us if you want to join us, or you can just add questions in the uh, 
in the chat. We have uh, South Africa in the building. Wow. Um, in California. So this is a, a global, we're, we're a global enterprise, Ms. Pinkins. Oh, I'm excited. And, I love that. So, yeah. So, you, so what, what inspired you to make Red Pill? <laughs> are, you, are you kidding me? Um, you've seen it, right? I have, yes. Okay, cool. um, a very, very good film. Um, inspiring. Um, I feel like if your eyes are open and you are just paying attention, there are just certain things that are obvious and inevitable about life. Uh, in America. And I live in New York City. And I guess I just live with a whole bunch of delusional people. So that uh, he was going to win the 2016 election was so obvious and inevitable. And people treated me with contempt. And it actually terrified me that I was around so many people who thought that this woman who couldn't beat a black man could beat a white man. <laughs> I was just like, are these people just crazy? So when I got, when I had the sense of what was going to happen for 2020, I was like, there's just no point, you know, in saying that to people. They'll just think I'm crazy. Well, what, let me make a story to go with it. And then people can go, oh, that's so far-fetched. Exactly. <laughs> and, and you cast yourself. Yeah. As, think, as the factors the, when you're financing yourself. The voice of reason uh, only black woman in the film so you know so you're it's sort of it's uh it's sort it's it's not a couple's retreat you're going to an airbnb to canvas votes in virginia of all places mm -hmm. and then uh as soon as you pull up you see some stepford wives looking stuff going on and uh what's different about this film uh the the black person is the voice of reason <laughs> that nobody listens to. <laughs> it's, it's sort or how of, we are in real life. Yes. Yes, it seems that way. Um, but uh, I, I was just tripping out the whole time because, you know, every, every horror movie trope that exists kind of pops up in this film. And uh, you're like, uh, people... People pay attention. I think we should leave. People, <laughs> they're, they're about to kill us. <laughs> and the movie does what it has to do. Yeah, which, which is wake wake us up a little bit. I think so. I hope so because some people still tell me it's uh, that it's uh, satire. I'm like satire. Like we live this for real. <laughs> this happened like right after the movie was finished shooting. This happened, but you know. Some people are still in their delusions. In the real life horror film, well, when they when they make a, a film, there's there has to be movies about Donald Trump's presidency being made, and I'm I'm not sure like where in the video store they're gonna put them. If it's gonna be in comedy, <laughs> horror, drama. I, I don't think anybody wants to see him ever again in any way, in any form. <laughs> well, well, let's let's talk about this. Talk about talk about your character in in the film. Like I said, I, I feel like she's the voice of reason that no one wants to listen to. But I mean, how would you peg her? I I felt like I wanted to to tell a story that centered a black female perspective in a way that really only black females understand. So I was putting all these moments in there that's like, you know, black women be like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, that's that happened to me. That happened to me. Where we are constantly telling people what's going on and they're ignoring us or they're gaslighting us or they're telling us we're being too extreme or, you know, everybody's doing something and we don't participate. And so we're not, you know, we're not being socially friendly. So um, that was definitely a part of it. I also felt like, you know, for black women who've experienced this, they'll figure it out early. And so it was like, you should laugh and you should figure it out because most people some people who are not of the global majority won't figure it out even when the movie's over. They'll still be asking the question, who was the red pill? And he'd be like, come on, I done told you that a hundred times through the whole movie, but you still got to the end and don't know the answer to that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that's that brings up a, a, a thing uh, that we've been seeing a lot in social media, the, the Karen and Becky syndromes. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, when these videos pop up. 
Well, you Is know, I made this movie this point? before that happened. You, you know, and so I was aware that I was um, trampling on sacred property because white women are not allowed to be attacked in any way. And I think probably we wanted the film to come out in March before the pandemic had it. I think that it would just been dismissed as crazy and ridiculous. But, you know, as fate would have it, the, the Karen thing became Karen's gone wild, became really crazy. And so much that I wrote about in the film really hit the news after the pandemic. And so, uh, yeah, it's like people say, did you write this after the 2020 elections? Like, no, we finished shooting it over a, like a year and a half before the 2020 election. Yeah. So there's a social dynamic that, that deals with racism, sexism. What are, what other isms does Red Pill explore? I think it um, explores, you know, in a very specific way, uh, the fact that white women overwhelmingly voted for him twice and that it increased this time. Um, you know, they always want to be the victims of discrimination, but they are upholding white supremacy. They are the foundation. They are the pillars of white supremacy. They birth white supremacists. So um, I think it's like taboo to ever speak that because they're discriminated against and they've taken over all of, you know, discrimination is now EEOC because they get to be included in it. So that's a taboo that I knew I was touching on that, you know, was going to make some people not want to have anything to do with the film. And I was like, okay. Um, it touches on the history of um, how the Democrats and Republicans got their names. I think that, you know, in hitting all the tropes, I flipped them in a lot of ways. Like, you're expecting this and then it doesn't happen in the way you're going to make it happen. Um, the way you're accustomed to it happening. Like I just kept flipping the tropes. Flipping right, you most certainly did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, you know, also your, your character comes from an activist standpoint, you know, like uh, the scene at the dinner table when you're singing along. <laughs> Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. <laughs> <laughs> It it made it definitely gave gave me a feeling not old hippie but well it, we're it, all middle aged people you know usually you yeah gotta film and it's the young people and that I first guess. ten minutes of the film when they're coming in you don't even have to pay attention because you're just meeting the monster bait you know that oh, that one's the drug addict so they're gonna die and oh she's the the slut she's gonna die whereas you know the intro to this film is smart people mature people who are talking about things that are important in the world. If you don't pay attention, that's fine. But if you pay attention, they're having important political conversations, climate change, non-gender binary, you know, who are the Democrats and Republicans really? And then that first sort of moment is, you know, they pass the state line and they take down the sign. And, right. you know, my character is like, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> you, you had a lot of fun. Now, how did how did you put this movie together? Uh, did it take a long time to write, to shoot, to produce? I mean, like, what was the impetus to like say I'm going I'm going to finally make my own film? I think I've been making shorts for a while, and um, I spent about three years um, shadowing uh, on television for directing. And at the end of three years, I knew that I could direct with my eyes closed television, and I learned that really television directing, if you're not the the director of a pilot creating the series, it's its kind of a glorified traffic cop job. Um, you're not really being creative. You're the appendages of all the people who can't be on set and you've got to exercise their desires and then you have to solve any problems they messed up on and you've got to solve it on time and under budget. And, um, and I also realized that they weren't going to hire me. Like short of me being on a show and putting it in my contract, it wasn't going to happen. Even, you know, I know everybody. So, you know, everybody's like, oh, sure, you can come and shadow. But people wouldn't give me that first job. You know, I had Warner Brothers saying, if someone will hire you, we'll put you through the program. We'll pay your first fee. And still, I couldn't get anybody to give me that shot. And so I just was like, okay. Like I'm, I'm going to have to give myself the shot, which is what I've done pretty much in everything else I've ever done. And I had a little bit of money saved and I had a little bit of time. Um, I 
got the idea for Red Pill in July and we were shooting October 31st. So I, I wrote it, cast it and shot it in a period of about three months. Wow. That's fantastic. And, and it was a short shoot. 10, 10 days with the main cast, a drone day, uh, a day that was supposed to be shooting me that, you know, the truck broke down. So we didn't get that day. And then one reshoot day because it snowed on our last day there. And so we had to go back and pick up some stuff. Wow. You got like special effects and all kinds of stuff going on in this thing too. So, so it's, it's yeah. not, it's not what, why horror as a genre, as opposed to a dramatic piece or musical piece that you're kind of known for already. Or I mean, you're known for fear of the walking dead, but. Because horror is my favorite genre. Oh. Uh, you know, I don't really go in for dramas. I really don't do chick flicks. I watch like if there, there's not very many horror films that are online that I haven't seen. I, I can do two or three in a day. I just love them. I go to sleep. You know, they relax me. I love the genre. It is my favorite, favorite genre. And it's a genre where you can talk about the truth and people can just pretend it's fantasy. So um, I was like, you know, I'm going to be saying some stuff that's going to offend a lot of people. It's totally not mainstream. Um, this is a genre where you can get away with that. And I, I was like, let me just it, it please myself. Let me scare myself and make myself laugh which is what I like in horror films. I need to laugh in a horror film um, where it's just too tense for me. So I was like, I really was like, please me. Fantastic. Well, Ron Fraser is on, on the line with us. He's a good friend. He is a big, big fan of yours. He actually met, he's told me he met you okay. years ago. Um, so I want to bring him in to the conversation to talk more about theater and and your influences that helped you to build this film, Red Pill. So with, sure. with us, uh, on the line, uh, Ron Frazier. Thank hey, you. Hey, Ron. Hi, Tanya. It's so good to see you. I interviewed you about 15 years ago Ooh. for WBAI Radio when you performed Caroline and Carolina Change, Tony Kushner's musical. It is a pleasure to see you in the producing hat, wearing the producing hat with your very interesting trailer. Thank you, Mike, for the invitation. Thank you. And Congratulations, Tanya, on finishing this film. Um, I, from the trailer, it looks very attractive to me. I want to see it from beginning to end. It looks like, you know, people were posing as progressives from the trailer. And <laughs> from the trailer, it seemed like they weren't really progressive. Like it was just a matter of time before they co-opted. And that really, that theme is not only among, you know, how the, mainstream economy, if you will, co-ops what the radical fringes do. You know, that's the story of America, but I see that part and parcel in terms of your own, Tanya, artistic journey, right? Going from um, playing soaps to going to the stage, but having roles that you stand up for. Uh, most recently, um, you declined how the direction of Brecht's play, Mother Courage, was going because it took away agency from that character. So could you just talk about how, you know, your message in this uh, new film is kind of part of your artistic arc? Sure. So this is real Black, right? It's real Black. I can be real Black. Be yeah. as real as you want to be. <laughs> okay. Um, so leaving Mother Courage was the culmination of, 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 of working on a series of shows with um, non-global majority people. And at the end of it, I, I, I was just like, I was just done with the theater. I was like, I'm not putting my gifts in the hands of these people anymore. I'm just not doing it. Um, they don't have enough money to pay me to come and work for them six days a week. And so I did one play in LA since then. But other than that, I really haven't been on the stage because I was just like, this is like throwing pearls before swine. I can't, mm. I can't do it. I'm getting too old to, to like do that. And then I was saying to Mike before we got on that the pandemic was a gift for me. Um, and I think it was a gift for a lot of people. And I think as they're seeing that people don't want to go back to work 
is that for the first time in 400 years, it was our first break from white supremacy mm. in 400 years. <laughs> We've been on this treadmill. Maybe we got off the slave, then we was on the Jim Crow one, and then we was on the sharecropper one. Nonstop. We on the get to be the exceptional black elite one. And then finally, we was just like, oh, oh. Making all that money ain't really worth putting up with them. Putting all them hours in to achieve some markers that they set for us. This is just slavery all over again. They, they just set some different markers for how we got to tap dance. And for me, I just got, you know, before we made the movie, I was just like, I, I just don't want to work for them anymore. I was finding that the opportunities that I was getting, I'm not going to, this is the last time I'm going to say this phrase, but it was like, it was getting to be that I was being hired to be one of the props that eats. It wasn't challenging to me. It wasn't, it wasn't an expression of all of my experience, what I was capable of doing. It's like, I'm at the top of my game and you want me yes. to be in the background and just, and so um, I have a lot of energy. I'm blessed with a lot of energy. And I feel like when you love something, there is all the energy of the universe flowing through you. So I was just like, I'm going to do something I like. And you know how I'm going to know I'm going to like it? White people aren't going to. <laughs> So my my you're, wife, you're an agitator. They mm. quit it. They quit. They 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 tried to sabotage it in every way. They would tell me, you know, be like, that scene is such and such scene. It's just so boring. I, I just I fall asleep. I can't stand it. Like, isn't it about this? I'm like, I said, that's how you feel. Mm -hmm. I said, that's it. That's it. It's working. I said, because that's how I feel when I watch most of y'all films. Wow. I want you to have the feeling I feel when I'm watching stories that center you. Yeah. You're not centered. Oh, and you don't like the way the white guy, he don't know the words of the song. Oh, cause see, you're not used to the white guy being the fool. That would normally be the black person or the Latino or the Asian. I made the white guy the fool. And that's not comfortable for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that's a whole inversion you're doing with this film. Mm -hmm. And as you said, the progressives are not so good or so smart either. Oh. So I was really playing with this idea of they talk too much. You just talk, 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 talk. And the other people didn't talk at all. They were all action. So really for you to say, so like, can we trust any of these people? Like, is this what we're going to, I don't think anybody in this group is going to be able to get us anywhere. Exactly. <laughs> Question, why Virginia? Because Virginia is the seat of so many lawsuits that uh, prevented our rights. It was the seat of, 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 where they bred us like cows. Mm -hmm. They made more enslaved people um, when the, uh, the, the bringing them in was forbidden, you know, when that was outlawed. So then they would force, they would have us raped and, you know, to produce more property for them. Um, cases coming out from, uh, you know, opposing Brown v. Board of Education, cases opposing affirmative action. Virginia is this kind of the seat of of white supremacist legal and political theory, it, it comes out of Virginia. So I really wanted it to be that state. <clears throat> Love it. Uh, you folks can join the conversation. Uh, I'm going to put the link up now. I'm having a good time. How about you, Roan? Very much so, Mike. Um, just a storyline in terms of how you, I saw a cornfield um, that you had there can you break down that particular scene where your character is looking at a cornfield? Well, you know, there's this idea, and this was Arthur Jaffa and I was talking about that when, you know, just bringing black people to somewhere <laughs> in the country, mm. with, it's, are we already in scary? And so I also was playing with, you know, some of the tropes that they use in their films, because like, you know, to get an audience, you gotta have some of them. So what are the things that they work with? And if you you know see the film, you'll see that what's in that cornfield is a black sambo scarecrow. Mm -hmm. Black sambo scarecrow. Yeah, there's there's <laughs> she's got a lot of uh, shocker moments you know, when the yeah. sound effects <laughs> jar you. I have my film scholar friend Anthony. He he his pet peeve when we watch films. The last film we saw together was Hamilton. Is to pause the film and talk about. So I'm sure if we, when we see your film together, um, he's gonna pause and talk about that Sambo in the cornfield and just the symbolism you you are totally wanting the audience to unpack, you know. And it's there's not a moment, there's not a frame of red pill.
that is not intentional. You know, some people who don't like violence, you know, they get upset with the opening 54 seconds, which is very violent. But it's a violent symbolism of the fact that black women have been violently doing the labor of this country since 1619. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that brings you bring up 1619. Oh. What, what, are you, what are your thoughts of that recent controversy? Well, I happen to be in critical race theory summer school right now with um, Kimberly Crenshaw and the African American Policy Forum. And so one of the things that they were pointing out today is that this attack on critical race theory is not new. Mm. That in 1883, um, after the 14th Amendment, when Black people began to try to put forth lawsuits to actually use the 14th Amendment to protect them, the court was like, oh, no, 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 no. You can't get special treatment. That's discrimination. You want to be treated like you're special. And so this is this this attack on critical race theory. First of all, it's not talking about anything that has anything to do with critical race theory. That 1883 case has not ever been overturned. And it gets brought up every time we try to use the 14th Amendment for equal protection. Anytime they use it to say that we are seeking uh, special treatment instead of equal protection. Because they are assuming there's neutrality and that there is an equal playing field when we all know that there's not. And so what we have to look at about this is they're redefining our terms and they're using it to put for, to, to bring ahead the very thing that the concept was used to interfere with. And they're masterful at co-opting the civil rights movement, co-opting yes. blackness in order to serve their degenerate purposes. So that's what's happening with this critical race theory. People are like, oh, someone, you know, Karen and I were talking about today. Well, you know, that's a legal concept. They're not going to do No, no, no. What this is going to do is now anytime any uh, non-global majority student says something isn't comfortable for them, you're not going to be able to say it. You're going to risk your job to teach anything. One of the classes today was a K-9 to teacher, and she was saying she's never used the word critical race theory in her life. But when she teaches um, the Black um, empowerment movement, she yes. doesn't teach it as a period of 10 or 20 years. She teaches it as beginning in 1619 and continuing today. Yes. Well, she's never used the word critical race theory. She's pretty sure that's going to come under attack. And the entire public education is going to come under attack because they never wanted us to be educated anyway, which I think could end up being good because, you know, the way they destroy the education system is putting them little white girls in our schools to criminalize us and say they were afraid of us. So get us back to educating ourselves with people who look like us could be a really good thing. Definitely. But this is definitely going after education. It's going after voting. It's going after thinking. They don't want us to be able to think. All right. Well, what 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 do you with with Red Pill in mind? I mean, clearly all horror films get sequels. There's going to be another election coming up. I mean, do you do you think we're in a better when I say we, I don't know what the we is, but that we're in a better position to thwart these things or that it's just going to flip. This is a this is a respite from the insanity that that what we, just, that There's we no experienced from the past. Oh, you okay? So it's a straight line for you, okay? Oh my God, Tom Cotton. They they just put the Senate just signed the bill that um no federal funding for anybody teaching federal race theory. This is the to move federal funds from schools. It's coming, and then there's going to oh. be vouchers, and it's going to be private schools, which began after Brown v. Board of Education, where they started with the vouchers because. Um, Milton Friedman, who put forth the whole economic policy that got us where we are today, he said something like force segregation or a force non-segregation are two equal evils. So um, they're always going to come up with ways to support not giving us our due as human beings in this country. That has not stopped. And to be real, you know, I'm reading George Jackson right now. Right, me too. I, and um, the only way they got where they are was with violence. And I don't think that's I think that's the only way that it, it's going to change. Well, I think that's what history tells us. I think your film is having a very important conversation about critical race theory and how the effort to undermine education and force it into the private sector um, is happening. And it's going to continue unless we as a people become as alert as your main character in Red Pill seems to be alert to how you know, the red pill is forced and forces people to 
subconsciously and then consciously accept the matrix. Um, it makes people like you and I feel like the minority. You know, yeah. I can tell from that trailer. And we have to be aware of how the undermining of critical race theory, the undermining of efforts to teach topics like the 1619 Project erode, you know, our education. And this is why uh, I, I applaud you for doing the work, Tanya, and producing rather than sitting back and complaining, um, t putting on the producer hat. This is always what Mike has demonstrated with Real Black. We have to be our own independent producers. What Woody King Jr. did in producing his film on Black directors and what you're doing in showing a story of how the system continues. You know, I'm very fascinated. Your film remind the trailer reminded me of how people with locks, you know, in the 50s, only people in Jamaica who had locks were beaten. But um, it's, it's a class symbol. My mother was upper class Jamaican. I could never, nobody with locks could ever enter her house or her mm. mother's house. Now, however, in the 21st century, you have informers wearing locks, <laughs> you know, working for the CIA. So your trailer just hit on so many cylinders for me in terms of how the matrix tries to evolve by calling itself progressive. And it's really up to the people to, you know, the Bible says, you know them by their fruit, not by their mm. appearance. Mm. So even if they look the part, even if they're, as George Jackson said in one of his letters, um, the idea that all blacks are our friends and are all whites are our enemies is a lazy idea. Skin folk, skin folk. You have to really look at their fruit. And I think I'm excited to really see how your film Red Pill will show us to really look at the actions of the people around us. What they say is one thing, but what they're doing is another. Could you speak to that? Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to speak to that. I'm going to speak to what Mike D said about a sequel. I do know what the sequel is. I've been trying to actually sort of lay it out in a, in a narrative game and twine, but my game skills aren't that great. So when I go to the crux XR thing, hopefully I'm going to get the narrative game. But it, the, the next level is we have reached a point in America where uh, slavery is back, mm. but it's based wow. on economics. Yeah, economics, economics. So you could be any it's color in this place because that's where it's going to next. Um, I think, you know, as I said, people still want to say the film is, is a satire or it's campy. Um, I think when you go really, really dark, you have to give people humor. And <laughs> I say some harsh, harsh stuff. I do some harsh, harsh. I mean, I, I lent a white man. Um, you know, so you got to have some, some humor with that. And, you know, the Democrats are no different than the Republicans and we're not doing anything. And um, I just, you know, as I made this, I thought it was going to come out before the election. So I was hoping it would be like, wake up, wake up. The film has won you know, like 30 awards around the country. There are black film festivals that like one festival, I, this is hysterical and I wear it as a badge of honor one of the elite, the Martha's Vineyard Festival, they rejected me for the deadline to apply. <laughs> I was like, somebody looked at this and went, oh no, oh hell no. Oh no, we have to bring this here up in this conversation. Mm. So like, I feel excited by that because it's like, oh, the black elite are like, mm-mm. Mm -mm. No, we know who Right. No, no. Not when you're talking about class. <laughs> And your no. film is clearly talking about class. It gets deep. Let, let me. Well, let me ask you before before we talk about the your theatrical, in you know, inspirations, the directors that you've worked with on on the screen and on the stage, that, and what you've learned from them. Before we get into that, I think Chicago. When I read your bio, plays a big role in terms of your perspective. I mean, can you can you speak to that, like your upbringing and being in Chicago? At, at a certain time and place? Yeah, well, you know, I was born on the west side of Chicago. And then I was raised on the south side of Chicago. And then I went to high school on the west side of Chicago. I went to Whitney Young at the same time as Michelle Rock. Michelle Obama. Class yeah. together. Um, Michelle Obama, for people who don't know that. And um, my people came up from Mississippi and Arkansas and Louisiana. So, um, you know, there there are people. I, I, I knew my I knew my grandmother's grandmother and her grandparents were enslaved. So I have this sort of lineage of having five living generations 
alive in my lifetime. And they really didn't want to talk about or remember any of that. And the push really was for me to do and be anything that was white, marry someone white. Like that was really a push, you know, for me. That was what they wanted for me. That would be the making it for me. And I love my family. Like whatever we didn't have, we, you know, everybody playing Midwest or jumping double Dutch or bringing in immigrants to live in the house and three and four people sleeping in the bed. I mean, look, I got my ass whipped with extension cords and up with some hard shit. But I love these people. And and like there was a forgiveness of spirit. Like my grandmother's cousin was drunk and killed her husband. She still loved him and cared for him till the day he died. Like that he had done this horrible thing didn't prevent her from still loving him and caring for him. And so that's the spirit in which I grew up. And when I got into school, I used to think I wasn't smart because... You know, I like to be number one, like I'm competitive as hell, but I realized very early on that all you had to do to get an A was to just pair it back to the teacher what they said. So I just thought, well, maybe I'm not smart because I didn't really learn anything. I just said them back. And then when I got to like uh, eighth, seventh grade, it was 76, there was the bicentennial year. And one of my teachers literally told me what to say to the people who were interviewing me so that I would be chosen. And so I, at a very early age, was very aware of this scripted thing mm, of everything and was always longing for where's the real, what's the real. And it wasn't in these rooms where I was having quote unquote success. Mm. Like the real wasn't there. Yes, I won a Tony Award, but I was young, I was sexy, I was, you know, having sex on stage. Okay. I'm good and I try to be the best that I can. But look, I'm, I'm aware that, you know, that that has something to do with getting a Tony Award. It's a campaign. You're not winning because you're, you know, it's not a meritocracy. It's a group of people who are campaigning and lobbying and you give me this and I'll give you that and you vote for them and I'll vote for them. So I'm always aware of the underworkings of things. And I guess I'm the bubble burster because I can't go into these delusions of thinking, oh my God, I'm so wonderful. Oh, I'm so the best. I'm like, you know, I'm anointed because white people are comfortable with me because I know how to speak their language. Mm. And when when they didn't convict Zimmerman, I made a commitment to myself. I said, I'm not taking care of their feelings ever again. Wow. And so my tolerance for saying what they needed to hear, and that was, that was the end of it. No more, no more, no more, no more. So that was 2017, the verdict came out, February? Uh, no, the, that, no, the verdict was like 2013. 2013, thank I you. 2013. Wow. And so since then, it's just, I have, I've have i had very little, my, my, you know, very little. Zero Fs to give. Zero, zero, zero. Well, now, did that come, was, was that an emotional epiphany or that was a, a calculated decision? No, it was, it was boiling, boiling rage. You know, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? And really not knowing what to do with it. And then I got to make this movie. And this movie was life altering because it was the first time I got to tell a story the way I saw it, the way I wanted to control, to know that you aren't going to like this and you're going to love that. And, and to have the same kind of control I have as an actress when I'm on stage. I get to play an audience. I get to, to make you like me, make you hate me, and play that and really mess with you. And that's what I got to do making this movie and to realize that white men have been building worlds for the last century. Oh my God, it's like the most incredible thing in the world. Like When you produce. To get to build a world, and because I financed it, you know, when my other producers would be like, well, I don't think that's good. I'd be like, okay. <laughs> Well, no question. No. I mean, but but this you you also said that the impetus for this was also um, the mainstream movie world wasn't giving the opportunities to to get you had to, you had to make a movie in order to get an opportunity to make their movies for them. I mean, do you have an interest now or? Honestly, you know, I did get a, an agent out of this and all of that. I, I'm kind of like, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to do nothing with them. I want to figure out how I can do my own things for us, by us. I'm actually on my way to Denver in Panama. Hmm. Well, it's sort of like, uh, did you see Dave Chappelle's interview where he said he, he wants to lend his talents to Nollywood? 
No. Yeah, he said he said uh, that he 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 could see himself making Nigerian film. Oh, I would. I told the people at Pan African. They said the people are always wanting to from there are always wanting. I'm like, I'm there. I'm so there. I, I just I can't see working six days a week for somebody else ever again. Mm. And I'm I just can't see, you know, sitting in rooms with people who aren't as smart as me, aren't as talented as me, yes. and then having to pretend to be right. to de- defer to them because what always happens with me is, you know, I know how to do that. I know how to behave correctly to ask for things when someone has a key to a gate that you need. Mm -hmm. I know how to do that. And so I will go and do that. And then those people, they are delusional enough to believe that they actually are making you by just getting out your fucking way. And then (laughs) once you get in there and you do everything and you don't actually need anything from him, then they're mad and they feel like you tricked them or something. And so now they want to do everything to show you that you actually can't do it without them. And then when you go ahead and do it, they just go, you know, that was the experience of me for Red Pill. I literally had one of my producers quit and she didn't even tell me directly. She sent the message through somebody else to come and tell me because she was too scared to tell me. She was too scared. (laughs) And, And she said, she always has money for who and what she wants and <laughs> then proceeded to try to extort me to that I better pay her this and it was going to go up $1,000 a week until I paid her. And the, the people, of course, she sent it to were like legal people. You better pay. I was like, bitch, bitch, please. <laughs> <laughs> please. We, we, have a, we have a question from the uh, audience. It says, Richard Copeland says, uh, Miss Tonya Pinkins, how did you convince actors like Ruben Blades and Catherine Urbe to take part in a socio-political film. Well, if you don't know who Ruben Blades is, Ruben Blades was the first uh, Panamanian singer to take salsa and make it about social justice. Mm. Okay, so I didn't even know that about him when I asked him, but I have always admired him and I was friends with his wife. Uh, She's an amazing singer. And so when I wrote this script, I wrote it with their voices in mind. And What I will say for me is that I have kind of priceless relationship capital. I'm good at what I do. And um, I don't um, I don't suffer fools. And I do things that most people wouldn't do, like people wouldn't risk their money, their job, their reputation uh, the way I do. And so when I call people and ask them to come play with me, they know the work is going to be good. And so I can pick up the phone and call people and ask them to do things because of that respect. But that respect comes from the fact that producers are going to say she's difficult. Difficult means you can't pay me to do something I don't want to do. So with the, sort of a synchronistically beautiful thing with Ruben and Luba, um, I didn't when I was on fear, Ruben wasn't there. He was out doing concerts. And when I got back to town, Luba invited me to their house for dinner. They have an amazing house in Manhattan. And we're sitting on their rooftop and Ruben says, you know, you really got to make your own films because Hollywood is never going to tell the stories you want to tell. And I was like, speaking of which, here's a script that I would <laughs> like you to do. Is that how you found the Red Pill script? How I found it? No, I yeah. had written it already for oh, them. you wrote it. And I had it in my bag. So when he was talking about people needing to do what they wanted to do, had to do with themselves, I had a script to say, I want to do that. And I'd like you to be a part. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So influences. I mean, you've worked with some, you've worked with not some of the best, but the best in Broadway. A lot, a lot of good people in television. Um, George C. Wolf many times i mean radio golf came after august wilson passed right so yeah so you I worked you... with august no nope. i worked with august on the piano lesson before it went out on the road um i got to work with lloyd richardson up at yale we did piano lesson and i did it at the goodman and also at the old globe so yeah i got to work with lloyd All right. well i need war stories now <laughs> <laughs> where, where where do you want to start? I mean, you know, like uh, I got so many war stories, child. We could be here all night long with my war stories. <laughs> well, I mean, ones ones that applied. Like, okay, it's one thing when you're being a difficult actor on on the set of uh, uh, a George C. Wolf production. George but, C. Wolf would never ever describe me as difficult. Uh, no, okay, no. But you you describe yourself people, as difficult. That's so why I'm just, 
That's why. <laughs> <laughs> you know so what, 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 what happens when the shoe is on the other foot? When you're used to paying for anything you want and there's someone who there's not an amount of money that you can get to pay for them to say yes, that's difficult. You're Ma Rainey. You're right. Exactly. <laughs> that, I was thinking that exact thing. You, need, you, you, need, you need demand need artistic integrity. You're not going to go any lower than where you not, but, but it's never about money because if I don't want to do your project, I just don't want to do it. So I had to learn things like, you know, you know, Scott Rudin was the God forever. I knew he was the devil. Okay. And I did not want to work with him, but I knew that, you know, there's no way you can tell that to your agent. This is the, the king maker. So I found all these other interesting ways to get out of ever having to work on any of them shows he offered me. I found ways to say this to him, agent, say this so that they would not want to work with me because I was like, well, that's not going to happen for me. But you know, people would think, they'll think I'm crazy that I don't want to go do a Broadway show with him. Oh, really? Well, you don't want to think I'm crazy now, do you? <laughs> So what happens when the shoe's on the other foot and you, you, you're having a rough day as a director and, and the, an actor is asking something that, that might be a little challenging for you at that moment? I didn't have that experience because I didn't have the time. I had to rely on actors who I knew could do it for me. We had two days where we had 14 page scenes and I told them we're gonna, we're gonna shoot it like it's theater. We're gonna shoot it straight through. You know, the most direction I would be like, we, we, I explained to them the politics of the film. It'd be like, you know, when we do this here, I need you to take a, when I say action, take a 10 count. When you get to this line, give me a 10 count. Cause I need to, I'm gonna need action. <laughs> That's about the acting notes I was given. Here I know I want to look at what you're doing. I want I'm gonna want some reaction here. I'm gonna just hold. So that's I didn't have any experience of anyone uh, in any way being difficult, and everybody kind of um, who came onto it they understood what I was trying to say and it was meaningful for them. So they were, you know, one of the people I'm not gonna say who it is because it sort of gives something away. Uh, when she read the script and I had given it to a whole bunch of very big name uh, women who literally some of them were just like, I, I, I'm scared of this. Um, and this actress called me up and said, thank you for uh, asking me to play this awful woman. <laughs> awful woman. And, and they've now won their first awards in their career for film from this film. That's fantastic. I can't wait to see it. So, well, back to war stories then. Um, what, what's an August Wilson story? I mean, what was he like? Um, you know, very quiet, very private. Um, definitely was hitting on Costanza then. She was the costume designer. He was with somebody else. So that was the beginning of that relationship. Um, I think, you know, that was with Rock Dutton. So Rock is, is masterful and a yes. genius. Um, I was coming out of professional uh, acting. So I think the say, I would say my war story from that was I played the role of Grace, who was just the girlfriend who uh, Charles would bring home. She had two little scenes. And um, I just act, you know did it the way I did it. And I would get exit applause. And um, I was aware that they were just never happy with me. So they didn't um, invite me to come to Broadway. And I felt so like, what was wrong with me? What can I do right? And then in hindsight, I'm like, you were a star and it wasn't a role for a star. Like you weren't supposed to get exit applause. <laughs> <laughs> exit applause, that's what's up. If From that opportunity came what after? Um, well, my first Broadway show was when I was 19. I did Merrily We Roll Along. So Hal Prince and Steve Sondheim hired me when I was still a freshman over my Christmas break in college at Carnegie Mellon. So that was my first Broadway show. And when you come to New York cast by those people, you know, it's a little easier. And, and you turned down Yale for, for Carnegie I Mellon? I did. I, that was foolish. But I did. Okay. I saw your rap. That's why I know these my things. My rap rose. <laughs> she roasts herself <laughs> before anybody else can say anything. She says it about herself, which is cool. Now, if if you were to cast yourself on a play where you had two sisters, who who would be your sisters in, in this lexicon of great actors? And you know, living or dead, even who 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 can That's you imagine? Because I wrote a play about my family that has six black women. 
Um, damn. Well, you know, I want to play with with uh, Viola because uh, she's so stunning. And I've gotten to work with Angela before she was a superstar. So I would want to work with those women because I think the dynamic of what we could do on stage together. Oh, give, 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 last, so give last names for our audience. I'm sorry, uh, Angela Bassett and Viola Davis. That, right. you know, the buttons that we could push with each other could just take one another to other heights. Felicia Rashad could be up in there. I'm, I'm casting my family drama. You know, it's got six women. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah, like, you know, I, I think that when you're working in the theater or anywhere, film too, when you're working with good actors where you're like, you're playing each other, it's like sex. I mean, it's like kinetic energy. And it is rare that you get the opportunity to play at that level with people where it's like, oh, you're going to do that to me? Oh, I'm going to do that to you. I got to, the last time I got to have that was with um, Diane Weist. Where you know she do something on screen, I'm like, oh, you gonna do that? We're gonna do. I'm like, oh, you gonna cry? Well, I'm gonna cry too. Let's see who can get the most sympathy tonight. And we would just crack each other up, just you know, just testing each other on stage. I love that. I'm right. thinking of a play That's that would like allow all those roles that you mentioned: Angela Bassett, uh, Viola Davis, and and I recently read the play. I don't know if you remember the production of it, Tanya, um, called "Long Time Since Yesterday" by P.J. Gibson. No, I don't know that play. Yes, that was um, Loretta Devine's big first play after she did Dream Girls, but a, a really good drama, a good family drama that would include all those powerful women you mentioned. But I mean, I, told you, I wrote the play. It's called Jeffrey Manor. I wrote the play Jeffrey, for all those women. Okay. <laughs> I love it. I'm, oh my God. Can, is there a way I can read that like before it comes out? Because I the know play? the wheels will be. Yes. Yeah, send me. If, if, if Mike gives we'll me now, I, I, I appreciate that. I'll send you I'll it up to well, it's, it sounds like you, you would have a field day with Denzel. Oh, man. You know, I got to meet him. He came backstage when I did Caroline in Los Angeles. And mm. he's like, he is so fucking raw. Like, I, I don't know. He's a nigger. He really is. And yeah, he would be somebody that you know because he can clean it up. But ooh, yeah, he would be exciting to play it. But you know, I probably won't ever get to do that. So. Oh, because you've 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 made your shift. Um, mm. George C. Wolf. Yes. Story or thoughts. You know, I, 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 I love George C. Wolf. Um, I don't think I could have survived in this business were it not for George C. Wolf. And we have had our ups and downs and a roller coaster ride. And I think he says we probably were married in another life. Um, <laughs> but there is uh, such mutual respect for one another's talent and intellect so that we can agree to disagree and we can get frictiony, gritty, and learn from each other. So uh, I am grateful for having him in my life because, you know, he gave me the opportunity. I mean, I've worked with him six times. He's given me the opportunity to actually do things that allowed me to know how much I had in me, to know that most of the time, the vessel that they're asking me to be in, I'm too big for that vessel. And so now I don't try to pour myself into these little vessels anymore. I understood. All of us miserable. <laughs> you, you did the Tupac play, However If You Hear Me. Oh, yes. yes. That's what? right. What was I that? that because that was all those young people, and I'm always wanting to support and be around young people and see what's next. You know, if I'm gonna do something, Seth I'm Williams sit with the young punk oh, with yeah. Seth Williams playing um, Tupac. Seth Saul Williams. Seth Saul Williams. Thank you for the correction. But I wanted to say, Mike, it's not August eighth. It's August eleventh. That's uh, August Viola 11. Davis's birthday is today. Is it? Yes. Oh, did I, I say know. August eighth earlier? Well, you did. August I August thirteenth. August thirteenth is the this is the day that's red pill screening. There's a red pill screening in in Harlem at St. Okay. Bryant Park, 130. St. Nicholas Park. Okay, thank you. St. Nicholas you. Park. You, you, lay, you lay it out for us. You lay it out for us because I'm Image Nation in the New York City Park District, and uh, it's going to be awesome. The cast is going to be there. Kathy Irby, Kathy Curtin, Luba Mason, Adeshalo Sakalumi, uh, Jake O'Flaherty, they're all going to be there. So we're going to have a little talk back before the screening, you know, talk, you know, talk about the movie before the screening. And then we're going to watch this movie. And yeah, I'm so, this is going to be maybe my first and only time to ever get to see it live with an audience. I've got a videographer coming with a little mini doc, you know, so I can do that. This is what's going on, you know, the behind the scenes <laughs> the kind of thing. <laughs> oh, bonus features, bonus features. I hear you. Yes. I hear you. No, um, my, 
Yes. You mentioned Nollywood, and I just want to thank Tanya. I was on social media um, two days ago, and I saw your tweet to Greg Carr asking him about the African Union Commission and why the leaders of the, and it made me think of Malcolm X and just brings up all those themes, Tanya, that you mentioned. Why is the African Union giving so much power, handing over so much power to Israel? And I was so grateful to read that you asked that tweet. Like, this is life for you. This is not. So when Mike talks about you making the shift, you know, I don't want your audience to really <laughs> underestimate that. The fact that you're like, this shift is not just artistic, it's personal, it's political. But as Rochelle Farrell told Angela Stribling, if you don't struggle in the art, if, if art has to be authentic. In order for it to be authentic, it comes out of genuine struggle. And everything, I have to commend you for really asking those tough questions about, you know, when are we going to take responsibility and stop giving everything over to the Europeans, even though we've been trained to do that. And that just seems to come out. So just want to thank you for that tweet. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Because yes. I want to have that conversation with them in, in class with Carr. Excellent. Excellent. I love it. We have another question here. I mean, did... Um... Tanya, what, what do you feel, this is from Miss Blue, what do you feel is one of the important traits you've had to cultivate that has helped you with your success? I think it's mostly being willing to have my, all my feelings. All <laughs> my feelings. Yeah. Having, having them. But, but I mean, like, if I'm sad, if I'm angry, if I'm depressed, to like, not spend time pretending that I'm anything that I'm not. Mm. And because I do that, you know, every feelings are like a river, they move. And so when you, when you let yourself have them, they move and then they turn into something else. And you may find that that feeling is actually covering something else. So if I'm feeling jealous about something and I let myself feel the jealousy, then I might find out, oh, I want to do that. Oh, so now what am I going to do so mm. I can have this thing that I'm not jealous of or, oh, I don't even want to live anymore. Well, damn, well, what would it take for you to want to live? It's because you, the, your creative fire is dead. So what you going to have to do to want to live? Because if not, you're going to kill yourself. Like, so just being trusting that whatever I'm feeling, whatever I experience is actually a gift to me to help me get to the next level, to sort of bless it. And then when you've lived as long as I have and gone through as much as I have, you kind of, you know, I'm not rich, but people think I am because I just don't take any shit. But I live a very simple life and I keep my life simple so I don't have to do things that I don't want to do. So Red Pill has been more successful than anything I think I've ever done in my life. Did I get into Sundance? No, but I've won 20 awards. And I say to myself, wouldn't the award feel different if it was from these white people? Mm. No. You know, would it, you know, when I think that, would it feel different to get an Oscar when I know people spend five to $40 million on an Oscar campaign? Is that supposed to make me feel good that that kind of money that could be used to save nations, exactly. someone's oh, going to oh. spend to get me an award? The people who have given me awards, they don't know me. I haven't paid them to be. They're just relating to the story. And they are outside of the USA, which I knew would happen. Mm. So like, what is success to you? Because I've been... I've won a Tony, which was something I dreamed of as a child. I'm so grateful that it happened. And then to learn that, you know, you have to buy a ticket to go to the Tonys. Then you have to buy a ticket to go to the awards. When I won my Tony, my producers only bought me a ticket to go to the awards. They didn't even buy me a ticket for the, for the, for the party afterwards. So my manager took me and we crashed the party. But like when you got to buy into all these things, how can you keep in your head the idea that any of this has any meritocracy or anything to, to so I just have never been able to buy into those delusions. <laughs> mm. 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 Only your feelings, letting the feelings feel and pass through and asking, being introspective, it sounds as well. Letting the feelings come and then also allowing the logic to come in. Why is this feeling happening? It's a logical reason. And just uncovering piece by piece and being okay with it, not being a popular, happy answer. Yeah. And, and really just getting to the point to be grateful for whatever I'm going through. 
to know that whatever I'm going through, it's part of my fate to make me what I was born to be. Just blessing it, especially the hardships, you know, blessing them. I mean, nine months after I shot this film, I had gone through three editors and spent, gone over my budget and uh, didn't have a film. And so I just had to go, you failed. They told you you couldn't make a movie and you didn't have the time and you didn't have the money and you have failed. And I laid in bed for a whole day and was like, I failed. And I let myself feel failure. And you know what? Failure don't kill you. So I let myself feel failure, but I'm a Gemini. So while the one's Gemini was feeling failure, the other one's like, okay, well, what can you do to get out of this hole? <laughs> so I ended up going to Seoul, Korea and worked with an editor in Seoul, Korea in the middle of the pandemic. Wow. Wait, so as an actor, I'm curious about this. Um, does the emotion come first or does the thought come first? I don't think that it works for me that way at all. Um, if I read something and it just speaks to me, usually the words come, uh, you know, if something is well written and it speaks to me, I don't even have to study the script. Like it, it will just be there. Like I never had to take a Carolina change script home. Musically text. It was just, I just knew the truth of it. Um, and I also just as an artist and a crafts person, I like to play against the expectations. So I'm always playing opposites. I'm always looking at how many things can I make someone go through in this moment to build to what the the the, um, the writer or the director wants. Like, okay, yeah, we know we're getting there, but how many things can I take you before you get there? <laughs> right. Right. Well, that's all evident in, in your feature film debut, Red Pill. Thank you. And uh, if you're in New York, you definitely want to go check this out. It's a free screening, free 99 free out on the lawn. You know, bring your mask, bring bring whatever is going to make you bring some red pills. Maybe I don't know. I'm just winging it. What what do you bring to a red pill screening? And and keep an eye open. Keep both eyes open. Keep all three eyes open. Uh, because you're definitely going to be enlightened. Uh, there's there's a lot of uh, sub, what they say ill subliminals is what the rappers used to say back in the day in this movie and um, and it's it's all full of truth I mean it's, because that's that's the key to this this particular movie and if if we're not able to be in New York this Friday where can people have a chance to see this film we are going to be distributed by a court international and I believe it will be released online in December. Fantastic. Well, you heard it here first. Yes, you did. I haven't said that publicly anywhere. Okay. So so if you're not, by the end of the year, everyone will have a chance to see Red Pill. Yeah. And it's also at, it's at uh, Black Star, it's at the Bronze Lens in Atlanta right now. Okay. It's at the Cleveland Urban. Um, it's at a festival in Russia. It's at a festival in Tarrega, Spain. Uh, those so are the go August to the website. festivals. Yeah. The website has maps of where it is and where it's been and the awards, the uh, redpillmovie.com uh, website has all that information. Any any final thoughts there, Ron? Thanks for joining us, Ron. By the way. You're welcome. Um, this film sounds like it's gonna ask all film reviewers in this country and the world to step their game up <laughs> and to just make sure that if, if the artist brings their A game, the reviewers have to bring their A game and not any less. So well, thank you, Tony. Know Thank you. It's so funny because, you know, you go on the, the websites and you read the reviews and, you know, I always say that what people say tells you more about them than it tells you about whatever they're talking about. And so, you know, white men always give it like a half a star and they just like, oh, it's the worst thing ever. And I'm like, oh, yeah, because actually you all are the fool in this movie. <laughs> of course, you don't like that's not a story you want to see. So. I think that that was another big lesson I got is when you're listening to a note from somebody, if it doesn't register with you, if it wasn't something you were already questioning yourself, just, you know, file that away. If you get it a whole bunch of times and you want to look at it, but then sometimes the note that someone gives you, like when my white producers were like, I just don't like that. I was like, that's exactly how you're supposed to feel. Perfect. It's yeah, Richard, Richard Copeland brings that up here in this comment. He said, uh, you said you're not making a movie to scare you. I'm showing you what scares us, and it's you. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So we want all. We thank you. Thanks. Thank you, 
Miss Pinkins for joining us. Thank you, Roan, for, for co-hosting this hour. Um, again, red pill is the truth. Mm. That's that's why we take these red pills mm. to get the truth. And you you definitely gave us an unfiltered hour of your time. So thank, thank you, you so much. And uh, please, you know, be a friend to the show. Don't oh, be a stranger. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. So we'll be back next week with Charles Woods. He's he's gonna give us some more street smarts, and we're gonna we're gonna have an, another enlightening conversation. So. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. I'm going to sign off now.